Today I want to switch back to uh, um, empirical, to examining empirical things. Uh, you guys have read uh, my paper. I'm going to talk a bit about that, and I'm going to talk uh, also about it on uh, on uh, on Monday. So some of the questions that you uh, had, many of the questions, comments you had were were on the returns to education piece, and those we'll discuss we'll discuss on Monday. But there are a number of things that come up that I should uh, that I should be able to address today. So if you remember, we, we ended up uh, last time by saying, or we, at some point uh, last, um, on Monday, we had this equation that uh, the level of education chosen by a family for their kids is going to be a function of the cost of education, the marginal cost for them of acquiring one more unit of, of uh, human capital, and of the returns to education both the immediate uh, financial return in the form of wages as well as uh, um, the human, how is it going to acquire the human capital of the next generation. So this is, uh, these are all things that people have been looked at, uh, have looked at. Uh, so we should expect people to respond both to costs and benefits. So the cost piece seems relatively uh, straightforward. Uh, one would look for uh, um, a setting where cost to education, direct or in, indirect, went down, and then look at uh, and look at uh, whether people respond by educating their kids more. Uh, and then the benefits is whether people respond to returns to education. That might be a little bit more tricky, and we are going to do a bit of that, both the actual benefits and the perceived benefits, which of course is in this equation. Uh, implicitly, something we hardly discussed, but just a little bit last time, is whether uh, the perceived benefits are the same as the real benefits. So let's start with the cost. Let's start sort of the straightforward piece. Uh, uh, so there are a number of papers that look at the uh, reaction to the direct cost of education. So um, in particular, uh, but this, uh, this is a bit of a biased review of the literature because it has mostly my papers, but uh, uh, I have a paper with uh, Pascaline uh, Dupin and Michael Kramer where we provide the uh, school uniforms uh, for kids uh, in, uh, you know, entering grade seven or grade, uh, yeah, grade six or seven or eight. Um, and we found pretty large effect there. Uh, we then have a literature that we'll discuss in much more detail. We have a paper on uh, the secondary school to education, which are much larger than the school uniform, uh, which, which we'll discuss in detail, detail on Monday and you're going to read, uh, which uh, again show pretty large impact. In a sense, what is, and Michael has other papers with other people on various forms of scholarships for schools. Um, uh, so uh, this literature is interesting, I don't, I, uh, in particular the uniform literature, because on the one hand you s you're seeing uh, effect, impact of paying for uniform on, on schooling. So that would suggest that people are, you know, appropriately responding to costs. On the other hand, these impacts are really large, uh, really, really, really large. Uh, so you get, for example, in our uniform paper, you get reduction in, uh, in dropout of a few percentage points. And the cost of a school uniform is, is $5 or so. So which even for a Kenyan family is not that big. So that is, at this, on the one hand, you get the magnitude right. On the other hand, it is not really, I would say, a vindication of this model because the impacts are too large in the sense that it, if, it, it, if the only reason why the cost to education enter is you're comparing them to the interest rate, then clearly uh, I know, to, to, I mean, to the, the benefits and uh, appropriately discounted by the interest rate, then that seems way too large. These are indicating huge credit constraint that they can't even find $5 or something else is, is going on. Yep. When you were designing that experiment, like why did you think about Everybody says it's a big deal. <laughs> like everybody says it's a big deal. In fact, we got to uniform. We, uh, this is a paper where uh, we looked at uh, uh, HIV. Uh, we looked at, we, we were very interested in, in uh, testing the impact of the government HIV uh, school um, 
intervention. So the government in Kenya was introducing a new program for HIV, um, which uh, we actually were reasonably skeptical about. Uh, this is called the ABCD strategy, which was followed at the time by most countries in East Africa. Uh, that stands for abstain, be careful, use a condom, or you die. Um, <laughs> that was the relatively uh, a kind of uh, fear mongering <laughs> among, in this order, so abstain is the best. Uh, be faithful, use a condom, or you die. So uh, this was uh, uh, an example of what's called a risk ava re avoiding all risk, risk avoidance strategy as opposed to risk mitigation strategy. So this program was introduced among uh, upper primary school students. This is grade six to eight. Uh, in Kenya, we were, uh, they were interested in evaluating it. We were interested in evaluating it. But at the same time, we were quite skeptical. And we wanted to compare that with a strategy that is just keeping girls in school uh, as a direct protective uh, uh, measure, as opposed to trying to teach them something on HIV when they're in school. So we wanted to have that. And um, it was pretty obvious to us that for, for kids that age, the, the uniform is a big constraint. They cannot go to school without the uniform. The school send them back without the uniform. Primary initially, when we started the project, conceiving of the project, there were school fees. So we were going to pay for the school fee. And the school fee went away. So we, uh, but we realized that the uniform were still a barrier. So that's why we did the program. Even though, if you think about it, from the comfort of your office, people shouldn't really be responsive to the cost of, to the presence of the uniform, but as it turns out, they are. So that's kind of how we came to, to that. It was less of a, and it, the results are pretty interesting in the sense that keeping, uh, just going, keeping kids in school, keeping girls in school does reduce uh, HIV. That program doesn't work. Uh, and in fact, that program undoes the effect of, the, of keeping girls in school. Um, so it is better to just pay for the uniform and do nothing else. Uh, that's worse than, it is worse than trying to teach them the ABCD program while they're in school. For reasons that we probably will get into when we talk more about health. Um, so that's, that's how this, this uh, came about. So this is like something that everybody talks about, the school uniform, even though this is not consistent with this model, uh, but that's probably a failure of the model as opposed to a failure of people's thinking. So that's the first set of costs. So I would say, just as a vindication of this model, it's not very, uh, uh, it's a bit half-half, <laughs> because on the one hand, you see people responsive to costs, on the other hand, they're way too responsive. Then there are the indirect costs, uh, which is the opportunity cost of being in school. So while you're in school, you, you don't, make money for the family. And it is believed in particular for uh, slightly older students, middle school, high school, that it, it um, prevents some kids from being in school. And this is one of the motivation of conditional cash transfer programs, which were introduced initially in Latin America, which has a, comp which has a component that is uh, conditional on sending uh, kids to school. And the idea is that that's actually a fair amount of money. Uh, that people get from the condition cash transfer. And it generates, uh, so as long as your kids go to school regularly and is not absent too much, is enrolled and not absent too much, you get a transfer monthly. So that sort of compensates for, uh, for not having the uh, their earnings if they worked on the market or on a farm or something like that. So that's sort of, that's also a, a way of manipulating the cost to education by creating a benefit that offsets an existing cost. So that's a form of uh, in in indirect cash transfer. Um, there again, I would say the results, the evidence to want, you know, in favor of this model are relatively is, is mixed because on the one hand, people are very responsive to conditional cash transfer. You do, uh, they are now been evaluating in, in, in dozens of countries, starting with the evaluation in Mexico, which was one of the first big prominent uh, city in development. Um, it was kind of replicated in lots of countries and uh, maybe bizarrely enough, because the first one was done with an experiment, everybody thought they had to have their experiment too. So it was experimented in many, many, many places. 
and, in, and you tend to always find uh, uh, impact on education, particularly uh, for these older kids. So that would be good, you know, that sort of uh, people respond to the cost of education. However, they also respond when the, when the cash transfer are unconditional. And there, again, remember, in our model, an easy rule, uh, just a, you know, a lump sum transfer shouldn't have an impact. Well, you could say maybe it's credit constraint or something like that, but uh, um, it's certainly not directly a, a response to the cost to education. So people are just about, in some studies, you find them somewhat more responsive to conditional cash transfer. In many studies, there is no difference. So we did one in Morocco, for example, where we found um, that uh, conditional and unconditional transfer are more or less equivalent, uh, with the unconditional cash transfer possibly a little more effective, actually, than the conditional cash transfer. So again, that's kind of mixed. While well, people respond to things that are meant to send them to school, maybe meant to reduce the, the, the cost, but they seem to do that even though the transfer is not directly affected to the cost. And then, of course, there is another form of indirect, uh, indirect reducing the indirect cost is, is reducing the distance to school. So someone asks, you know, how do you think about this intervention, the school construction intervention? And one very natural way to think about it is you reduce the cost of going to school by making the school very nearby. So it's much easier to, to, to go there for the child and for the, for the parents. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the idea of, uh, of, the, uh, of my paper on Indonesia. So someone asked how I came about uh, with, to, with this idea. Um, so maybe that's relevant. Uh, second years, I've already heard uh, saying that because uh, that I, I mentioned it in the, uh, in the paper writing class. But that, that turned out to be my job market paper, although I didn't know it was going to be my job market paper. Uh, but I was sitting in development and, and in labor. And in labor, we've only talked about instrumenting for education, saying it's so important to instrument for education because there might be ability bias. People who are more likely to, uh, to go to school are also may, may be more competent in various ways, and therefore they'll earn more money anyway, even if they don't go to school. Right? So that's the ability bias. I thought, well, in development, that seems worse because it's not just your ability bias that in fact, it doesn't seem to really be there in rich countries. You don't seem to have uh, uh, to change the return to education much when you control for this selection bias. But I thought probably in development, things would be quite different because there are many reasons why kids would go to school, like in particular the connections of their parents, the money of their parents. That might be related with someone's uh, ability to, uh, uh, to get a job later. So I thought the ability bias would have to be larger. And then I was very surprised that there was no study using instrumental variable in development. So I thought someone should write this study. And I was trying to think about what would be a good instrument and thinking about distance to school being a good instrument. But then thinking, well, that's not going to work because if people are closer to school, they probably are in more urban setting. So what you really need is a change in the distance to school. Well, where would that come from? Well, if a country started building a lot of schools, that would reduce the distance to school. Is there a country that has built a lot of schools? And so I, in the back of my mind, I was looking for that country which had built a lot of schools. Now, separately, uh, we had, at the time, we didn't have a second year paper, but we had to write an econometrics paper. And I had written mine on Indonesia because there was a good data set that a lot of people use to do any number of things called the Indonesia Family Life Survey. So I kind of started with Indonesia, and I went to the library, and they have all the World Bank reports. One of you found this report that I found, 1989 report, that, but they have a bunch on all of the countries and what they are doing every year. And I thought, let me start with Indonesia, since there is this data set which I already know. And then I, uh, I found that. I said, that's great. That's a lot of schools. That should reduce the number of, uh, of schools a lot. So let me, uh, let me see whether I can do something uh, with that. And then I quickly realized that, so first of all, I had to find the number of schools. And I had to find a large data set. I figured that such large data set exists. 
maybe from that same report that they were using it, this kind of large uh, census and intercensus survey. So I knew that this data set existed. I didn't know that the number, the data on the number of school existed. But I thought probably it's somewhere, has to be in some library in Indonesia. So I um, went to Indonesia during the summer and I hunted for the data which I knew existed, that's the outcome data. I had to go to the statistical office to find it. Um, I think, you know, I'm sorry. I, you know, I paid some money to someone and they gave me the data. <laughs> and, I, I <laughs> and I didn't probe too much, like, but that happened. Now it's much easier. The data, since then, the data from Indonesia is made very easily available. The uh, Australian National Agency Fund gave them a lot of data to make their data available. Um, and then I went to the library. I knew who had implemented this program. There was the, plan, the planning department. I went to the library of the planning department. I asked them, would you have this data? And they gave me like books, which showed the number, the, the number of uh, schools that were built in the year, the, the plan of the schools, etc. I made some photocopy and I was done. And then I had two more weeks to spend in Indonesia and I got very bored. That was the, uh, the, the end of that. So that's how I came to, to that. Everything lined up quite nicely. Uh, it doesn't have, you know, it's not always um, like that. You know, there is any number of places where this project could have collapsed. But uh, uh, in this instance, you know, like I was lucky at every step. Interestingly, I was initially interested, um, so I had no idea how good an idea it was. I just thought, you know, this is, I was, I gave this advice to someone yesterday and I think it's good advice that it's very hard when you start working on a, on a research project to think about whether that's going to be a A plus contribution or a B minus contribution or no contribution at all. Uh, it's hard for you and it's even hard for people to talk to you. So I think the best guide that I have found is to write the paper that I wish I had read. You know, I want to write the paper that I wish to read. And then you know that at least one person will like it, and a pretty <laughs> important person because that's yourself and you're going to spend a lot of time with that paper. And the rest sort of works itself out. And I just had no idea that in, in and of itself doing all of this step was so key. It seemed to me very easy. I thought of it as a, a skills, like doing skills to take a strategy that is very, very well established somewhere and transpose it to another context. Uh, and in fact, in my mind, it, would, it was going to help me think about non-parametric returns to education. I had read a paper which was very uh, uh, new at the time by uh, Whitney Newey about uh, um, estimating non-parametric uh, system with triangular, uh, with uh, this type of situation where you have an instrument for, uh, for the variable. So I thought that's where I'm going to get, and at least that's going to be something new. Now it turned out, for reason we're going to discuss very soon, or if not today or on Monday, that it was completely inappropriate to do that. And I, not only that, but I could have intuited it from the beginning that if I had an instrument that affected people going to primary school, I was not going to be able to use it to, to, to extrapolate to the entire uh, distribution of uh, the returns across the entire education spectrum. So I had thought about it, I would have realized this was not, this part of the project couldn't get done. Uh, but it turned out that even without this part of the project, that, that was a good paper, or at least uh, um, underst understood to be a good paper, got me a job and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so all that to say that it's hard to, you know, it's kind of, it was a nice project because the, the steps were so clear to me and then you know I was lucky to get them done I was not stopped by the fact that I didn't know if I would find the data would take some risk and then uh, uh, even though the steps were so clear it was simple at the time it was sufficient now of course everything needs to have more bells and whistles but uh, um, I think the general principle of not being discouraged in advance by this is too easy or this is too obvious uh, still holds so that's uh, for the autobi autobiography of <laughs> related to this paper. 
Uh, so it's a difference in difference. We are going to see a lot of that. You are going to see a lot of that in your career. If you're an empirical person, at some point, you'll probably estimate some version of an event study graph or a different diff diff. Um, um, it's, you know, in the simplest setting, it's uh, pretty straightforward. You have two groups and then two periods. Um, and then the group uh, gets treated in the uh, post-period and not in the pre-period. And your identification assumption can be written in this way, which is if you think of it in terms of your potential outcome untreated, uh, it's a function pot possibly, you know, very flexible function very of, you know, anything could happen with respect to the group. Uh, it could be related to the, sorry, to the group, uh, to the time period. But, but what's not there, that's going to help you for identification, help us for identification. What did I purposefully omit from this uh, uh, um, equation that determines if? Uh, the interaction between belonging to the group and being Exactly. Treated. So we assume that, uh, you know, maybe people who are uh, younger will get more education because they are younger. Countries is richer. People who are uh, in some region will get more education than others, but uh, uh, there is no the younger people in the place that are more educated would not otherwise have been even more, even less educated. So that's the assumption we're making. And that's the key identification assumption. And in a lot of difference in difference application, the trick is going to uh, both justify this assumption from a priori principle. Um, and uh, uh, kind of gather as much evidence as possible that the assumption is, is in fact real. Once we have that, then we're in good shape. So if, if again, if we have two groups, two period, then the uh, different diff estimator is simply, also the, the object that we are trying to, to estimate is the, uh, the difference in mean uh, um, between pre and post and pre for the treated group minus the same thing for the control group. And there are the identification assumption that I laid down. That's going to give you uh, the, the, the impact, the average impact of the program. Of course, we don't have these things, so we replace them by population averages uh, in, in our, uh, or by sample averages. And uh, the, the different diff estimator is now going to be, should be a hat there, is going to be the average uh, uh, Treated, um, treated group post minus treated group pre minus treated, uh, control group post minus control group pre. I would like you to, uh, to do three lines of algebra when you go home, uh, which will convince you that uh, this, uh, and this is numerically equivalent to estimating an OLS regression on uh, a group a treated dummy, a constant, a treated dummy, um, um, a post dummy, and the interaction of the two. Okay? With undergraduates, I make the calculations, uh, um, but I'm going to assume that you can make it. That's the, from the OLS formula. So it takes uh, little lines of algebra, but it's interesting. It's, you know, it's good to have in mind. You really need to know. Uh, and sometimes we ask this question in the exam and not everybody gets it. Uh, you really need to know what this is. This is the difference between uh, pre and, uh, post and pre, beta 1. This is the difference between um, uh, treated and controlled in the pre-period, numerically. And this is the different diff. Okay? This is something one needs to know in life because you get to. So in our setting, uh, we have a relatively swift uh, school construction building program uh, financed by the oil boom in 1973. So someone asked how it came about that they decided to use their uh, oil money to do that. What's the political economy of that? So the political economy of that is uh, 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 they, uh, Suato came to power after a pretty bloody uh, civil war. Uh, millions of communists were killed. Uh, the country was not in good shape, um, either politically or economically, when he took and consolidated power. And his view for fixing that was to try and uh, 
uh, create a national identity uh, which was uniform for the whole country. And to do that, he sort of invented a whole ideology called the Pancasila, uh, really promoted the Bahasa Indonesia language, uh, which interestingly is the language of no one in particular. It's a group, it's a trader language that's not spoken, was not spoken in particular by the main ethnic group. And he thought schools would be a good way to diffuse that ideology and to diffuse the language and therefore to create a sense of national unity after what they had uh, experienced. And uh, before uh, that, the, the um, Indonesian is an oil producing country, but before that, the, the oil proceeds used to go to the places that produced the oil. And another thing that he thought that he would consolidate both his power and the whole place was to use this um, proceed in a more uh, uh, equitable way. So he decided that all of the money from the oil had to be redistributed by the center in social programs. And one of and the school construction program, so, so, so they are called this in-press, in uh, presidential instruction, by presidential instruction. So the in-press, the, the education, the primary school program was the first of those. Then there was a water and sanitation program. So the, but when they started, it was very small because they started to, the, the first year of this is, was 1972, and then the oil boom came, and then it became, I think, much bigger than what they had anticipated. And they kind of stuck with it, both in terms of uh, how to allocate the rules, how to uh, allocate the schools, and to continue using uh, oil money for, uh, to this purpose. So it's very different to Brazil, for example, where the oil money is being spent in the provinces that uh, extract it. Or in fact, a lot of the oil is in the sea, so it's extracted, it's used in the provinces that are uh, in line to, <laughs> to the sea. And, and, and that money, there is a whole literature showing that that money is not very well spent uh, by those places. So that's the political economy of that. Uh, then they decided that they were going to, uh, to allocate the schools uh, because the objective was to get to 85% enrollment everywhere. So they were going to allocate the school as a function of the difference between 85% and wherever the, school, the, the place was. They had uh, uh, their census in 1971, so they were using, basically used that to say, uh, to basically linear increase till 85%, and in principle, it should have stuck at 85%. That's another uh, thing that I tried to use and didn't use to see whether after 85%, it should have flattened, uh, and so one could use that for a neater identification, but it didn't quite, uh, it wasn't, it was too smooth, so it didn't work out. So with that, just so it depends on the pre-campaign enrollment that gives me my uh, difference in difference. So I'm going to define a group uh, of, uh, of treated people, which are the young guys, uh, and then uh, treated in control region. Um, uh, are, to start with, we can say, well, let's say below above the median. And then we can do a simple different diff. Uh, for year of education, so this is this are uh, uh, sample average for the high uh, in program intensity and the young people, high program intensity and the old people. The first thing we notice uh, among the old people, there was uh, uh, the education level. So this is years of education uh, attained by adults uh, who were kids during this period, is lo lower in the high intensity region. That makes sense. Right, because the, because uh, uh, they were putting more schools in places that had less education to start with, and they are still lower in for the young kids, but uh, less so. So the difference is uh, 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 the difference is positive, um, although uh, it's you know it's insignificant. So this is illustrative, but it's not very precise. So that's, that's good. So then now we can look at, uh, uh, we can be a bit concerned that in, even in the absence of the program, the young co cohort would have converged maybe to the, to the old cohort because well, go back to our basic model, things converge and there should be one steady state to which everybody is going and it's within the country. So we would expect convergence anyway. So am I just capturing that? 
So one easy way to do that is to compare the old to the very old. Um, and uh, uh, we can do that with that kind of control experiment. And then we can see that at least before, uh, it seems to be that the, the trend were in fact parallel between the two places. So that's, that's uh, encouraging. Uh, the, the old and the, the, these are already my old and this is my very old. And if I had done the different diff for them, I would have found a much smaller number. Uh, and so that goes in the right direction. Now, uh, this is all, this is quite crude and we can do better than that. And that's where we have, uh, you know, first of all, we have many groups. Uh, so in some places they build uh, one school per thousand kids and two school per thousand kids and 100 school per thousand kids or, you know, it doesn't go till 100, but so we could think of uh, several treatments. So in, in, our, uh, in our case, you could have one, two, three if you have not very many, or you could have, uh, in our case, we can say this is something discrete. Uh, and I'm going to replace my uh, simple diff by basically a regression uh, pre and post on the number of education differences, uh, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the number of kids that were built. So again, if I had only two cohorts and I only relaxed that, it gives me, um, uh, I'm now need to control, I need to put region fixed effect. So that's control for any differences. Uh, and then I'm going to assume here, I make the assumption that the effect is linear in the number of school. Uh, so I'm uh, um, regressing on an interaction, not anymore on a treated dummy, but on a number of school per thousand kids dummy. And that gives me uh, this regression, again, that I can do by comparing uh, just uh, the young to the old. And so now this is interpreted as a saying that in the places that, uh, um, that got one more school for each extra school per thousand kids, the uh, increase in education between the young and the old court is 0.12 years, faster. Does that make sense? So this is how we, we, we read that. That's a regression. We, you, can, you could have read that, you could have run that as a regression of the uh, difference between the young and the old on the number of schools per capita that were built in their region of birth. Uh, um, controlling for uh, any differences between the regions. And we can do the same, ex uh, the same experiment between, the, between the, 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 the old and the super, and the super old. And um, things are now much more precise, although they are too precise for reasons that I, in, that I will come in a minute. Uh, my standard errors are completely off in that paper. Um, I, I didn't know bad, I didn't know any better, but I now do know, so I'll do so this and another half for, off for reason I'll discuss in a bit. But uh, at least it seems uh, quite a, a bit more precise, or a lot more precise. So that's good, it looks like every thousand schools increase the number of years by, by uh, uh, 0.12 years, and now we can do, uh, the, the, we can use the fact that in fact we have many cohorts, and also that perhaps we have a prediction so instead of controlling, first of all, instead of controlling for, uh, for uh, just the post, I could control for uh, uh, one dummy per year. That's not going to change anything. Uh, but more interestingly, I could, uh, instead of having just an interaction for post and, and uh, the number of schools, I'm going to now control, I'm going to have an interaction for every year dummy and uh, uh, and the number of schools, which you can think to the, the way this is written, which starts at uh, from the absolutely uh, um, youngest people, uh, oldest people until the very end. You can think of running a series of different diff, where every time you're comparing uh, the people born in 19, um, I think the oldest people are born 1950 or something, 
you compare them to people who are born, you do a different diff between the 51 cohort to 50. The difference between 51 and 50 uh, regressed on the number of schools that were built, and then the difference between 52 and 50 on the number of schools that were built, etc., etc. And that builds you your. Uh, so this first one is just treated, and the second one is uh, combined with the treatment of schools. And that gives you this uh, typical event study graph. Uh, so this is the one for education, where you know I started here at zero for 24 for the oldest uh, for the oldest people. And so this is a defensive um, sort of the continuous defensive for the 23, for the 22, etc. This is run as one regression, but uh, this is uh, each of these dots compared to, to, to the oldest people. And I do have a prediction that there was the, wasn't any school built that these guys could go to if they are older than 12 in 1974. So I shouldn't see all of these guys should be zero. And then as schools, more schools get built and people are younger, so they, they get to enjoy them for a longer period of time. The, the prediction is that the treatment should, uh, the treatment effect should increase. So at that time, I think people really liked that graph. Uh, since then, they have become very, very, very uh, uh, common and fashionable and important. So I'll, uh, and so this graph has a lot of issues. <laughs> uh, it's it's not really it's it's not the way that one would construct a, such a graph today. And uh, I'll show you all of the things we need to add. But uh, at this time, I, you know, I, I, I was kind of pretty satisfied that if you eyeball, this looks like a straight line. This looks like an increasing line. And that's um, what uh, we would expect. So that's encouraging. Once we have uh, uh, found this, we can say, well, now that I have convinced myself that uh, this is, in fact, zero, I can impose it which gives me a large control cohort. And now I'm I can co construct my diff and diff all with respect to the control cohort. So all of this is going to be normalized, normalized as having zero effect compared to, uh, to them. And then this is going to be compared to the entire group. So someone asked, why would you do that? Well, you, you do that because you get much more precise results if you have a control group that's much, fa much larger. Um, and oh. so that's what I did in that table, uh, where I still I estimate per, per, uh, that's what's done here. We are here running aggression with only uh, uh, ten dummy or eleven dummies, which are all the people treated, and their various treatment effects as they age. Uh, and then once we've done it for wages, we can also, for education, we can also do it for wages, which will lead to what we'll discuss next time for the... Okay, so that's all nice. Uh, this is a very typical example of a different diff two-way fixed effect that have become super popular in applied economics, and you're going to keep seeing them. This one is a simple one because uh, everyone got treated at the same time. The only kind of complication is that the, the, the effect, the treatment is introduced progressively. So we would not expect no effect and then a program effect, because we expect the treatment itself, the intensity keeps increasing, so the impact should also keep increasing. There are also many cases where states are adopting policies in a staggered fashion, or regions are adopting a policy in a staggered fashion. So for example, uh, you could have, uh, 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 you know, changes the minimum uh, minimum wage laws that one state uh, approves, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one, uh, and then you have. You can also compare even in these settings, even if everyone eventually adopts, you can still uh, uh, estimate the impact of the policy by comparing, for example, people who haven't adopted yet, that people to people who. Um, to people who have already adopted, and, and that group keeps changing over time. So in this setting, so that's called the staggered, uh, staggered design. So this is a one time, one shot, the policy starts. That's the, those examples are staggered design. 
And there is a whole literature for how to do these things, right? The first thing with staggered design is that you, you want to, to uh, um, put them in the right place. You want to relabel them such that zero is the beginning of the of time, is the, you know, is the time where a particular state introduces the, the policy. And everything is, you will draw your event study graph not in calendar time, but in uh, pre and post the event time. Event being the policies being adopted in a particular place. Does that make sense? I mentioned that because I'm going to show you an event studies graph before, but to understand what it means when the policies are staggered. So there is an active literature on how to do it right, uh, which means that this paper uh, is, you know, is uh, not right anymore. Fortunately, it's <laughs> the findings are still mostly right, uh, but uh, um, there is a lot of things you would do differently. First of all, is the standard error. Um, so we discussed at some point very briefly the, the idea of clustering standard errors. So at a minimum, how would you cluster the standard error in a in a diff and diff? A program like this one where you have individual data but the, pro the treatment, the, the program is allocated at the district level. At the minimum you want to cluster at the district so Kabupa 10 times year and that because that's where you know everyone in a particular district in a particular year is has the same number of schools. So that's one which is not done in that paper, uh, but is easy to do, doesn't change much. Uh, but could have, you know, if the outcomes between people in, uh, in a given district here were very correlated. Then uh, you need to, then there is one more worry, which is that, suppose that instead of having annual data, in fact, I, I think in that data set, I have people uh, exact uh, uh, birth date. So I aggregated it by year of birth, but in truth, you know, people's months of birth also uh, affected. Uh, so instead of uh, aggregating, instead of ag aggregate, aggregating the data, running the regression at the district time year level, I could have said, let me run it at the district time month, right? Why not? It should be more precise and it's going to give you more data. Um, and suppose that I, you know, very uh, seriously cluster my standard error at the district time month. Suddenly, I have many more clusters than in district time year, so I'm going to get results that should be much more precise. Does that sound right? could move further, I could say, well, I'm going to aggregate at the district time day of birth. Probably I'm back to, you know, very small clusters now. A lot of very small clusters should become very precise. Uh, should I want to do that? What sounds odd? Um, you eventually run out of uh, freedom degrees, degrees of freedom. I don't know because I'm not running. I'm still running exactly the same regression. So in terms of the number of, or I'm going to have more dummies for uh, day of birth, and but that's not really a problem because I also have a lot but, of observations. But uh, not have treated and controlled people inside the same cluster. Yeah, I could have very small clusters, but that's fine. I'm going to have uh, the the smaller the cluster, the better per se. Yeah. Is the issue that the treatment is correlated? Exactly. It sounds a bit like I'm manufacturing data. I'm not manufacturing data because the number of observations will be the same, but I'm reducing the cluster size. We agreed that I needed to cluster at the level of the unit of the treatment, and we said, well, that's about that's year time district. And then and now I'm making it, well, year times, month time district, so I have more cluster, basically more effective observation. It sounds like uh, I'm creating precision that seems too good to be true. And the issue is that 
the treatment is very correlated by uh, your year of birth. In particular, uh, someone born in February or March is treated almost the same, right? Their level of treatment is almost the same. So that would in, in and of itself be fine, except that their outcomes might also be correlated because they are in the state, you know, they are in a labor market roughly at the same time, etc. So more, yeah. But what if, uh, it's, I guess it's a similar scenario, what if we observe multiple observations of the same person? Yeah, likewise. If we observe multiple observations of the same person, we wouldn't want to treat them as individual observations. So you cluster by individual? So exactly. So the question, in that case, we would cluster by individual. We would say, you know, they all come from the same person. We would either make an assumption about how, what the time series of this error is, or we would just cluster by individual, saying, I'm acknowledging that they're all coming from the same individual. They are not independent observation. Therefore, I need to take that into account in my standard error. Similarly, for people who live in the same district here, we say, well, they live together. They do a lot of things in common. Uh, we need to cluster at that level, because the treatment is also clustered at that level. And then, similarly, as uh, you both are getting to, um, People who are uh, living in, uh, in, who are from the same year of birth, or similar years of birth, similar months of birth, have experienced similar uh, education condition, labor market condition, their outcomes likely to be correlated, and their treatment is very correlated. In fact, with Defendiv, it's really extreme because once someone is treated, they stay treated forever. And therefore, there is a mechanical, very strong correlation between treatment status of people who are, uh, who are born in, uh, in related years. Because uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't go off on and off. Therefore, we need to take that serial correlation over time into account. The simplest way is to do exactly what you're saying, which is instead of clustering at the district times year level, we are going to district, we're going to cluster at the district level uh, to take into account the correlation in the outcomes of people who live in the same district and are born in different years. The clustering, so the correlation is not one, and, but the clustering let, you know, will let the data figure out roughly what it is, unless we have very few clusters, in which case you start, you need to do other things. Yeah. And if you had data, like monthly data of the construction of schools, would it make sense to have clusters that depend on the time as well? Yes, you could, you could do that. Uh, you could say if you had monthly data on school construction, you would have uh, your treatment defined at a month's time place. Uh, but then you would also want to cluster at the place level because for sure there is a lot of autocorrelation in the number of school constructed because it keeps going up, it doesn't go down. And uh, the outcomes might also be correlated for people in similar cohort over times. So that's the first thing we have to do. That is, we've known, f yeah. Would it also, I mean, this would still be, I think, you would still have the auto correlation that you can handle once you cluster at the district level, but would it be like slightly preferable to calendar year to use like a school year so you're getting the people who are born into the same uh, school year? Yeah, you could have a bit more precision that maybe if you 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 could uh, you could try playing with that. I do think the calendar year is the school year is calendar in this particular instance, but I'm not positive yes but that's so that doesn't that's not about it's not a standard error problem it's uh, define your treatment in a more precise way so you're going that's going to give you more precision uh, that is going to be reflected in your standard error so first thing that I didn't do <laughs> that I now know you have to cluster at the at the district level and when you do that actually the, the estimates are less precise you still have a significant impact on education, but the, the, the impact on wages are a bit, uh, are a bit dicey. Uh, then you have this uh, uh, a series of series of papers that are much more recent that you're going to see in the you're going to see more in recitation and in the in the problem set. But I'm going to make the list for you. These are my understanding of the papers that needs to be read now if you're interested in doing ever doing an event study or difference in difference in your life. One is the Goodman-Bacon point, which makes this point of uh, uh, stacking the data appropriately if the, the event is staggered. Uh, one is, um, so this idea that it's a bit loose, that, oh, there is, is there a pretrend that everybody is testing 
uh, that takes this paper uh, takes that idea more seriously in saying, first of all, how would I test for pretrain? Second of all, you could not reject the pretrain, but they are there anyway, so we, we should control for them anyway. So it gives you some tips for controlling for any pretrains. Um, this paper is great. I'm going to show you two graphs from this paper, but it's fantastic. That's in your, I think eventually it's probably every, everything you need to know in, is, is in here. I'm willing to bet that that becomes the standard and everybody else is forgotten. It's a review paper on how to uh, do an event study graph as well as how to control for, uh, for the pre-trend. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you their event study graph. We can compare it to mine. Uh, but it's a review for the annual review or something like that. So it's very pedagogical, it's well done, and there are uh, state codes to it. So my sense is it's your one-stop shop. I just found out about it recently. Otherwise, it would be in the, in the syllabus with three stars. Uh, then another issue that you might get into is when, if the treatment effect are heterogeneous, um, then uh, what you get from just a simple difference in difference in the stack design is a weighted effect of all the treatment effects. And usually that's fine, but if you're unlucky, some weights could be negative, uh, in which case you're a bit uh, screwed. So there is some work uh, to correct for that, construct the right standard error. Um, it's an issue uh, probably to check. I would. In my sense, probably less of a central issue than, uh, than, than doing that properly. So here is their uh, sort of their event study graph after all of the suggestions have been implemented. Um, so maybe you don't even need to read the paper. You can refer uh, to this uh, very uh, uh, neat summary of it. I do think you should read the paper. But what do we need to do? Well, this is our event study, so it's uh, zero is the point. In our case, in my, my case, it would be uh, 12 in 1974 would be my zero. So what did I do wrong? So first of all, they suggest that it is better to normalize uh, the year before. I normalized here at the beginning of my period, but of course that doesn't make much sense. You would want to normalize the year before the study, so I should have used as my omitted category people who were 11 in 1972. So you normalize at, uh, at minus one. Then I have no confidence interval in any of my graphs. Actually, some of them have, but not too much. So you should have the confidence interval that everybody's now doing. What they suggest adding as well are this longer, this longer uh, confidence interval, which is a uniform confidence band. So it takes into account the fact that you are not just testing one by one by one, but you are testing all of them. So the standard error are a bit uh, wider. Uh, then uh, here they put uh, the average of all these points. So it's basically the average of your outcome in the, it's normalized as zero in the regression, but it, it's not zero, of course. There is a, so it's an average of your outcome in the pre-period. So it gives you a sense of uh, magnitude and how the, how the magnitude of the point estimate compare. Um, uh, what else do they propose? They propose also to, uh, to plot what you think is the more restricted model. So in this case, the assumption was that there is an effect, there, you know, there is a pre-period and then there is an impact. So that's the restricted model. So you can see you know, the extent to which there is deviation from that uh, restricted model. In my case, I would have built, I would have drawn this or in fact, I could have drawn something somewhere. At some point in the paper, I had drawn the number of school built. So you could build, you could construct for every child how many years of effective school they would enjoy. And that would be your restricted effect if the effect were only proportional to the number of school multiplied by the number of years you have to enjoy. So you could compare it to the, the, the shape of the coefficient. That makes it easier for the reader to do that. Finally, you could introduce, you could put in the legend of the graph. Uh, so here, they, they, what they suggest in the paper, but for some reason it's not here, is a p-value of all these guys being negative. So here you would not be able to reject. I think they are nice and negative. So a, a val test of all these things being negative. So that's the test, a formal test of, sorry, being zero. Formal test of, uh, of uh, uh, zero pre-trend. 
and then a formal test of the restricting model. In this case, the restricted model is that the treatment effect is constant once it starts. And here you can see that it looks like it's not. And in fact, they introduce here the, the test for a constant effect post and they reject it. So that's in the, that's, you can put that in the, in the legend. So I put both the pre-trend and the constant treatment effect. But for some reason, on this graph, they only have them. So that's your state-of-the-art event study graph. If you're a second-year student, you're writing your, uh, your um, second-year paper, you want. And you, have you are planning on an event study graph. It needs to look like that. And that's another suggestion they have, is to, uh, to plot uh, kind of the, 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 the least wiggly line uh, that, uh, that fits all the points in the graph. So here are the least wiggly line that fits all the points in the graph is a straight line. So that basically is a way to tell you it doesn't fit, it doesn't, uh, it, does, it looks like this is all pre-trend. Uh, and here, uh, this one, the least wiggly line possible is quite wiggly, so it seems very unlikely that this is due to some other thing that is moving in this funny way. So in our case, in the case of the in-press program, the least wiggly line that fits all the points would probably be, have been nice and like that, and therefore quite unlikely to be explainable by something else. But it's a way of making this argument in a less in a impressionistic uh, way. So that's the kind of state of the art of difference in difference. Any question on that? I thought it would be a good, uh, good occasion to put all of these on slides and you'll have a convenient way to uh, refer to them later. Um, so that's uh, also what, you know, what I have to say also on substance in terms of what concerns the people's reaction to the cost of education. I uh, will go back to this paper. Uh, so many people have asked about general equilibrium effect and I'll get back to, uh, I'll get back to, to that when we discuss last time, next time. Actually, did write a paper about it. So I have a paper that looks at uh, the, uh, the, the impact of the school construction on people who were not affected by the school construction to get at the, to get at the equilibrium effect. Uh, let me spend the last uh, 10 minutes we have, 10, 15 minutes we have, thinking about uh, the other aspects of what, what else enters in the, in, in the education production function, what people seem to be responding to. So one very nice feature, of, a very kind of specific feature of this model is people should respond to the perceived return to education. Um, so how, how one would go about testing that? Uh, so Rob Jensen uh, first exploited the fact that people make mistakes on what they think they return to education are, and therefore you can just tell them the truth and by telling them the truth you are affecting their uh, uh, their perceived return, and you, you could see whether, therefore, they, re, they react by, by uh, going to school more. Uh, so he did this project in the Dominican Republic, uh, where the completion rate for high school is low, uh, and he first went to the students and asked them um, their view of returns to education by comparing, by asking them to say how much someone with um, for those who have completed primary school versus those who have completed high school, what's the difference? Uh, by the way, where, what's the, uh, so let me finish that and then I'll ask you. At baseline, the, the people seem to be, people here seem to be underestimating the return to education, which by the way is really not a, a generalized finding. Uh, in my experience, people widely overestimate the returns to education at least to secondary education. But in this instance, they were underestimating them. Um, they thought that they would get only a 10% increase from uh, uh, moving from the eight to the 12, when, when in fact it's much bigger than that. But then what they did is that they told them the truth in some schools. Uh, so the mean serian return are more like 10% per year, so 40% for going from eighth grade to, to high school. And then after some time, they compared who stays in school. Well, first of all, they show that they update their beliefs, and I'll show you that in a minute. And then they investigate the impact on education. 
So before I go further, what's the issue with doing that? Or in fact, even with asking them uh, in this way, the difference they thought between in the income of someone who has completed versus not completed. What is potential concern in doing this exercise? Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess one thing I might not even fully understand what that means is yeah, they might not understand what that means, and in in some sense, yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, depending on how the question was asked, it's not clear if it's like the return for like an individual who chooses to do bills or do primary school versus the meeting, or if it's like also giving into account the ability. Yes, exactly, exactly. And in what is given to them. Is, uh, is full of the ability bias, potentially, or the selection bias of any kind. Uh, you're telling them the difference between the earning of someone who has completed and not completed education. That's not the return to education. That's not the causal effect of education. So potentially, you are lying to people, which is a bit problematic. Or not lying, but giving them an information that's not accurate. It's not accurate for the average. It might, and then the other kind of part of your answer is that it's not even the, you know, it's about an individual. It's not necessarily the relevant information for any particular individual, which of course you don't know. So that's a little bit of a dicey project. But again, maybe we didn't know until, you know, this, is, this might be 2020 hindsight. But uh, that's certainly something that people uh, criticize. They do find an, an impact uh, on education. They find that people generally update their belief uh, positively. And they find an average impact on education. I'll, let me show you the table. So uh, perceived return have, uh, have increased. On average, these treatments regress for a bunch of stuff. Doesn't matter. The RCT, you shouldn't need any of that. And then, uh, so this is the average effect on perceived return. And then the average effect on various things, whether they return, whether they, uh, they finish the years of schooling. And then they actually find larger effect for the, the poor, for the rich household than the poor household, possibly because in addition people, you know, uh, they are also maybe credit constrained. People can't do it immediately, so return is not the only thing that enters the decision. So, um, if you had to run this regression, having done this experiment, if you had to run this regression, would you run it this way, or would there be another way to run it that would make more sense? Yes? Does it mean to take into account the fact that the treatment effect is different depending on how much they are underestimating? Exactly. So at the minimum, you should think that the treatment, the treatment doesn't have a monotonous effect on these other things because some people, uh, even though on average people were underestimating, it is likely that some people were overestimating and some people were underestimating. So at the minimum, when you are doing this kind of debiasing in treatment, and uh, you know they have become popular, we are going to see other examples of that. You should uh, 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 look at, you should separate the sample by the people whose uh, prior you're moving up to the people whose prior you're moving down, because you would expect the effect to go in opposite direction. Well, that's just a note of uh, how one could have done that. So. Uh, given so this paper was criticized for what I'm telling you, which is that basically you're telling people some junk that's a little bit uh, uh, troubling. Maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, and then and there are other papers that are trying to use papers that are trying to use the, the real data, data from the real world, to look at the, the um, how people respond to the return to education. An older paper uh, uh, by Foster and Rosenzweig uh, in the AER, quite nice, uh, looks at the impact of high yielding variety and argue that uh, high yielding variety grain has a large impact on return to education because basically you need to be able to read the package and understand what it is and then have some suggesting evidence that uh, uh, the return to high yielding variety is very low for people who are not educated and very high for people who are educated. So the introduction, which is a bit sequential as well, of high yielding variety across villages has different impact, 
as um, increases the return to education. So that's the first thing that uh, they say. And then as a result, when you see high yielding variety uh, 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 being introduced, that should increase people uh, educating their kids because uh, the return to education have now gone up. Uh, and they find that. Now, one issue with that exercise is that at the same time that it increased the returns to education, and it sort of increased people's income. And we've seen that in you know, a richer model of the world, income effect would also increase uh, uh, education in and of itself. That's not an issue for them because they don't believe in income effect. So you know, the only thing that could possibly have happened is, um, is, um, is the response to returns to education. But one could be worried about that. Two more recent papers that have, uh, which are uh, on the same, uh, uh, which have the same, those two papers have a little bit the same mechanism at, at hand, is a David Atkin paper uh, and a Sarah Hernandez paper. Sarah was a graduate student here and now teaches at uh, Northwestern. Uh, they look at export jobs uh, and export jobs coming from the garment sector, mostly in Mexico and the flower sector in Colombia. And they show that when these jobs are introduced, it leads to dropouts of girls, despite the fact that people are richer, which they explain by, by the fact that the return to education are now lower because you don't need to be educated to get any of these jobs. So you can get a good job working in a garment factory or you can get a good job working in a flower sector without education, so people dropped out. In the example of David, they got screwed for it because then the sector disappeared and they found themselves without jobs and without an education. Uh, that's the, the, the full story of that paper. But so the advantage, advantage, the, the advantage of that example is that the return to education go down at the same time as the income go up. So we don't have the, the income effect and the substitution effect going in, in the same direction. So if we find education dropping, it's, it's, you know, it seems likely that it's because of that. But then Jensen went back like one step further and say, well, you know, you didn't like my be uh, uh, changing the belief, so I'm going to change the return. Um, that uh, seems like ambitious to say, uh, are you able to change the return to education? And he had a great, great idea, uh, which is to uh, um, uh, participate in a recruiting campaign for call centers. Uh, you know, this type of things when you call for your computer, and typically it's a nice young person from uh, the suburb of Delhi, where suburb is intended in a very broad sense, <laughs> who is answering the phone. Um, so early on, they were really uh, recruiting mostly in Gorgan, very close to Delhi. And then um, uh, they started expanding, and he worked, he worked with them at the beginning of expansion to kind of lead them to villages where they had never been, uh, in Haryana or in UP, so basically a broader sector around UP. Um, he connects the, the, the BPO, the back office, back office processing operation, with, uh, with the villages. Someone goes to the village, advertises the possibility, uh, and then um, sees what, what happens. So some girls uh, who were of the right age and had the right education, which is secondary education with some English, went. Uh, and he's interested in what happens to the younger girls uh, who could not go yet, they were little, and they're more likely to stay in school. Uh, so what he finds is that uh, um, women are indeed, younger women are indeed more likely to be working in a BPO, so that's, uh, that's good. Uh, there was no such effect for men. Uh, and that uh, both younger, and both this woman, but also the younger woman uh, the girls uh, uh, were more likely to be uh, uh, in school. Uh, and uh, even, the, even younger um, are better fed. Uh, um, so basically the parents, the story is parents realize that there is more returns to girls in general, they become more valuable in general, and in particular more valuable if they are educated. So the return to education for women have gone up and they start uh, uh, educating them more. So interestingly, there is no effect for men. It's not discussed much in this paper, but I have another paper where they separate the boys between people who 
at baseline, were described to be the one who were going to take care of the family farm, so usually the oldest boy versus the younger boy. And when they separate that, they find that actually when the BPO recruitment started for the boys who are supposed to work in the family farm, the education went down. And for other boys, it's more like girls. And so the idea there is that you're very scared to have return to education go up for the boys because you don't want them to leave because someone needs to stay to take care of you and to take care of the farm. And therefore, you're going to suppress education so that they don't, you know, here the return to education for you uh, are, are, are negative from the point of view of the parents. So that leads a little bit to the conversation we had uh, um, with uh, Tishara and others about the contract between the family. That if you cannot contract to get the money back from your boy, then you are not sending them. Um, okay, so there are, there are two other things that uh, I, I wanted to do that uh, I didn't have time to do. One of them I'll do later. Uh, uh, the, when we talk about the family, that's fine. We can we can take that. That's the Rebecca Dizon Ross paper about the fact that parents have no idea what their kids are up to. Uh, but this one I want to briefly uh, mention. Uh, it's a paper by uh, Sima Jayachandra and Adriana Irasmune, who is looking at another return to, uh, way of affecting the return to education or the way returns are affecting. It's simply the fact that how, how long are you going to live? So if you expect to live for a very short period of time, then your education is not very worth it. Or if you expect your girl to live for a very short time because she's going to die in childbirth anyway, then you know the re you're, she's not going to experience the return for a very short time. So that's a very economist, economist way to think. But uh, uh, it is quite interesting that it works here. So what they are looking for to know whether people, so in principle, the implication of this model is that if people expect to live longer, they should, uh, or expect their daughters to, to live longer, they should ed educate them more, because they're going to enjoy the return of this education over a longer time period. So you're no, you need an instrument that affects the uh, number of years you, someone can expect to live without affecting anything else, like the skill premium or the low, uh, or the low skill wage, which seems like a very hard problem. And what they find is, to, is a, a, in Sri Lanka, a program that introduces ambulance uh, in, in all the villages. And when they did that, uh, infant mortality uh, collapsed. When they did that, infant mortality collapsed. And in particular, the, the drop in infant mortality was much larger in places where infant mortality was very high. So basically, the, putting the ambulance flattened out the infant mortality curve, leading to huge decline in infant mortality in places that were you know, really far from the hospital and people couldn't get to the hospital. So the ambulance kind of eliminated that. So now they use that in saying, well, that affects, that affects the, li the, the, the life expectancy of the woman, but not the man. So now I'm going to use basically the pre-ambulance uh, uh, maternal mortality rate as an instrument for the decline in maternity, maternal mortality rate over the period to see whether people seem to uh, respond by, uh, by uh, educating their, uh, their girls more relative to the boy. So now what, the, what we have here is a triple difference specification. I'll write, just write down, uh, put the specification down, where we have, we can have a uh, fixed effect, we can have a two-way fixed effect, whichever way, district uh, year, uh, district time year, and uh, um, gender time district and gender time year. So all of the double interaction can be there because what we are going to use is uh, maternal mortality in a particular year, like the time when they were, they, you know, when the parents could observe it, times the female, uh, the and they find, uh, uh, they find that more maternal mortality, uh, less education. So using just that, uh, they find that more maternal mortality leads to less education. So that's kind of a nice paper because I think many people were kind of intuiting that something like that might be going on. Uh, but since everything is usually correlated with everything, it's very hard to test. 
and this um, like ambulance program that was that had such a massive effect on maternal morti mortality reduction gave them a chance to to test the idea. All right, so sorry, uh, so we're done for today. Sorry again for uh, uh, slow start. And uh, on Monday, we'll continue talking about the Indonesia paper, but we'll talk about this, the uh, estimating the return to education. We also talk about the Ghana paper, which I'm asking you to read uh, uh, as you go along, which is another take at estimating returns to education or impact of education.